basically I've got uh, three sections to kind of go over. Uh, first of all, I'd like to talk a little bit about last week and uh, the presentation that Ivan made. I would also like to talk a little bit about um, your homework, if you will. Uh -oh. But uh, basically, that would be just your philosophy. We're going to go over that a little bit and uh, talk about uh, your pr practical applications of your philosophy. Uh, we'll talk about some principles of trade and industrial education um, and see how it actually plays out in the classroom. And as we do that, uh, I want us to be thinking about uh, our professional image. The final section we'll look at, um, and it'll be kind of dependent upon how much time we have left, would be um, that digest of federal education acts that you find in your textbook that begin on page 106. And I'll outline uh, and we'll discuss briefly those that are of particular interest for us. And uh, so without uh, further ado, Let's go ahead and begin. Uh, see if I can get my Where are we at? PowerPoint. Oh, shit, 106. Page 106, where he's going to go in section 3. But There was nothing missed. He was sitting there going side to side the whole time trying to get, this, they were trying to get the system going. Good deal. All right, thank you. Okay. like that's going to work too. Good deal. First thing I'd like to really talk about this evening is some of the philosophy statements that you sent in. And we got, I got several responses. I was hoping that I would get a lot of variation. And uh, I did. One uh, person, or this is kind of a, a a summary of what I got. One of them was learning by doing, uh, also learning from mistakes and learning from experienced instructors. Um, this, I guess, shows that uh, it's a vocational orientation. Learning by doing. Most of us have a hands-on approach, I think, to what we teach, don't we? Uh, we teach a skill. We do things with our hands. Uh, also, you can't do things perfectly the first time, can you? So we also have to provide uh, our students an opportunity to learn through their mistakes. Okay. That's some good ideas there, I think. It's also a good idea to have a mentor or an, inspir an experienced instructor to learn from. Another person said that their philosophy had to do with teaching practical knowledge. I think that really sounds vocational, too. That a lot of what we teach is practical. It's not the abstract. It's not something that you just do for a mental exercise, but it's really something that's practical and useful. And I like that one. I also like this, that not only do we teach in vocational education, should we just teach the skills, but we should teach leadership skills as well people skills and that we should motivate our students and that their philosophy as a teacher was one that said that they should be a big motivator for their students not only just to learn but to be really good at what they do to be professional 
whatever. I think that's good too. I like that one. Someone else mentioned that their philosophy of education, and I suppose vocational education in particular, uh, is that education is really essential. It's a must for all of us to have. Uh, and along with that, education is equal, import equal in importance to other necessities. I don't know exactly what necessities they were talking about. They didn't elaborate, but um, those necessities, I would assume, would be uh, the necessity for uh, food and clothing and shelter and all those other sorts of things that we might list as necessities in life. Because without education in this world we live in today, it would really be difficult to get along. Another person stated that their philosophy included uh, that everyone should be given the opportunity uh, to learn. Everyone should be given the opportunity uh, for education and that in that education they should also be taught perseverance. That is sometimes education just doesn't come just because you sit in the class or because the opportunity is given, but the effort has to be made. That's kind of what I got out of it anyway. Another one. Education is the means to prepare the individual to be a productive citizen. I kind of like that one. Education is the means to prepare the individual to be a productive citizen. Let's think about it for a moment. Is that a philosophy or is that more of a, maybe a definition of education? Look at it again. Means to prepare the individual to be a productive citizen. Maybe you could say that's sort of a philosophical definition. I don't know. Education should be a lifelong process. I think that's probably a philosophical viewpoint that it should be a lifelong process. That once you have education, it cannot be taken away. It is yours. Not like other possessions that you have. That's kind of a philosophical statement. Education opens up opportunities to the individual. I can see where that might be a philosophical viewpoint as well. In, in the uh, statement of needs for vocational education, that's one of the principles that we operate by, isn't it? That the student should profit by the education. To me, profiting by the education means opening opportunities. Not just getting the gray matter stirred up, but it should actually offer a better life. Okay? Look at we uh so we've looked at some of the uh, philosophical statements that were sent in. Uh, maybe some of you recognize some of those. I didn't change them a whole lot. Um, maybe some of you who I, I haven't received yours yet or um, you haven't sent them in or whatever, they weren't there. Maybe you kind of recognize them anyway. But I want to think about them for just a little bit. If you'll recall when we talked about philosophy, uh, it had to serve some purposes, didn't it? First of all, philosophy should answer some questions, shouldn't it? One would be what is true. Two might be what is of value. Uh, three might be what is real. So when I looked at these philosophical statements that you sent in, I looked for those things. 
Now, if we were to go back over uh, those statements that uh, I just showed you and that we read, how many of them really answered those questions? Think about it for just a minute. How many of those really made a statement of what was of value or what was a truth? Takes a, gives a little bit different perspective to the, some of those statements, doesn't it? For instance, lifelong learning. That, to me, makes a value statement. That says that a person, no matter what their age, should find value and necessity in learning. Okay? That can apply to vocational education, academic education, all sorts of learning, can't it? But I think as a broad overall statement, vocational and t &I education fits right in there, doesn't it? And it makes a real statement of value. And so, yeah, I can say that's, that's a real good philosophical statement. Um, but some of, some of the others, uh, I, I tend to kind of question a little bit because they're not particularly broad in nature or because they don't make a statement of value or truth. So what I'd like to look at next is what we call principles. Now, this is not in your textbook and this is kind of added uh, by me, but I think it's important and we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, you will see it again in classes that you'll take later. In fact, on the graduate level, uh, there is a, an entire semester class devoted to principles of occupational and adult education, as well as an entire uh, semester class devoted to philosophy. And believe me, those two semesters didn't cover it all. There, were, there was a lot left once we really got into it. So, Let's look at some principles of trade industrial education, okay, and see how they may uh, apply and see how they may fit under certain philosophies. Okay, principles. Principles, first of all, are specific. And as we looked at philosophy, philosophy was a broad umbrella that uh, it were, they were guidelines that gave us an idea, a framework of how we could answer questions of truth and value and, and uh, how we can make decisions about things in life. Principles narrow it down and are much more specific in nature. They address a specific issue, generally. They guide practice. So, there are some, it, when you look through your book, it'll say uh, principles that we live by or principles that this education should go by or whatever. And they are intended as guiding uh, practice. Okay? They are also used to justify your actions. For instance, if you have a set of principles laid out, and most of your professional organizations will, uh, to guide your practice. You can go to your administration and say, okay, AWS, the American Welding Society, or um, any of the other bodies that certify professionals, they say, this is a guiding principle of this profession. And so, as it applies to the profession, I think it needs to be included in my classroom. Okay? So, it can justify the way you uh, organize your class. It can justify some of the activities that you do in your class. It can justify some expenditure that your administration or... Um, your, your school may not otherwise understand or 
may not see or may not know about, and it is a way for um, you to justify that outside of just your own desire. Okay, it it, land, it lands uh, legitimacy and credence to your program. Okay, so I hope then you kind of following what the principles really are. Look again, principles are specific in nature. They address a particular issue, they guide, they guide practice, and they justify action. Okay, let's look at a couple of examples to show you how they all fit together. Now, I'm doing this because I'm going to want you to do the same thing a little later. This will be part of your handbook. This will be part of some of the exercises we're going to do tonight. And I hope as you mature and you uh, grow as an individual and as a teacher that this will really be a good way for you to organize your thoughts and to really help you become more professional in what you do. Okay. Let's look at a philosophical statement. Vocational education should prepare a student for employment. That's broad in nature, isn't it? It states the truth, does it not? That one of the reasons for your existence as a vocational instructor and the reason for the existence of your program is to prepare students for employment. That's pretty broad. It doesn't necessarily address any particular trade or profession, but it's broad in nature. Let's look at a principle that might apply underneath that. Training on tools and equipment found in industry will help prepare students for employment in that industry. Let you think about it for just a minute. Can you see now how that specifically relates to the tools and equipment that you're going to have in your program and how it directly relates then to preparing a student for employment? Okay, let's think back again about a reason our, our uh, one of the things that a principal should do, and one of those should be guide practice, all right? If your practice is just to have models or just to have little small uh, kinds of equipment that is not really the full size and doesn't really function to do the real thing, is that training on tools and equipment that's really found in industry? Or if you have tools and equipment in your program that are outdated, does that really prepare the student for employment? That goes right then again straight to the idea of justifying your actions or justifying purchases for equipment and tools in your program. Because if you can buy one of those principles that says the tools and equipment should be the kind that is found in industry, then it should be in your program, right? Because your philosophy says that your program should prepare the student for employment. Okay? Let's, let's look at another one. Oops. Another principle that might be related to this overall philosophy would be that the vocational student organization should reflect industry organization. For those of you that had my VSO class heard that before and you know what I mean by it. But some of you that haven't thought about that before might think about that. Now I know Scott uh, and his uh, law enforcement class last 
semester had decided that he wanted to uh, arrange his vocational student organization so that it reflected industry organization. That would be that there would be uh, officers and there would be a sergeant, there would be a captain, and so his organization followed, a student organization followed that model. Um, did you go ahead and go through with that, Scott? Yes, I did. If I could hear it. Yes, I did. How's it working out? Excellent. It saved me a whole lot of time this year as well as last year. And they're, res okay. they're responding to it real well this year. They're really taking the responsibility and uh, just making it work real well, better than it did last year. It kind of helps them see how what they're learning now kind of applies to uh, what they're going to be doing, doesn't it? Yes, it does. I'll put it on return here so you guys can see what I'm seeing. Okay. So, see, that is a guiding principle because you have an overall philosophy that what you teach should prepare your students for employment, doesn't it? Okay. Let's look, let's look at another one. What's he talking to me? The school shop safety standards should reflect industry standards. Okay? Think about that for a minute. Your shop or your lab safety standards should reflect industry standards. Okay. What industry standards might we be talking about? The standard of the body shop, Don, that uh, really isn't very clean and the guys don't wear the right kind of uh, respiratory equipment and that hazardous materials are not handled well. You can find really bad examples of safety, can't you? But industry standards should be those standards that are that should be adopted, first of all, by law, second of all, by good practice, and third, as those outlined by the professional organization that oversee. Now, most of those that have accreditation by the professional organization uh, are gonna have higher standards. And you can see, uh, on different body shops or mechanic shops, it'll say uh, ASC certified technicians here or uh, something like that. Okay, so you, you, can, you can know as the public, as a customer or as someone who's looking at that business that they have adopted some standards, haven't they? Okay. Let's look at some more examples, all right? The philosophical statement, all persons and professions can profit by increased professionalism. Well, what are we talking about here when we're talking about professionalism? Think about it for just a minute. What are we really talking about when we're talking about professionalism? Now this is supposed to uh, give us a way to, of deciding how we act and what we do. Okay, professionalism. I'm supposed to be a college instructor. And I'm going out over the airwaves on television. So you would probably expect to look at me and see some standard uh, personal appearance, right? Hair is pretty neat. Um, I've got a, you know, kind of a dress shirt and nice tie on. Tonight you'll notice the 
tie is kind of conservative. Not at all what I usually wear. And uh, <laughs> he's got shorts on. If you I were to legs. see me, you would say, "Okay, the guy is dressed kind of nice." We saw your legs. He looks the part of a professional. Did I see his legs? Instructor. Okay. I saw his legs. He's got shorts. I have gone many times into other programs, and I've <laughs> seen instructors that look <laughs> shabby. The pants got shorts. Well, they're not really saw. clean. Uh, they did not look like a professional. And so it could be, too, that some of what you see may be uh, misleading. It may actually not be what that person thinks of themselves. They may be just trying to put on a little bit of a show, maybe, and that when you get into the substance of their program, that they really are not kind of what they appear to be. So professionalism has to be more than just initial appearance, initial uh, impression. It has to go deeper than that. And it has to go ahead and follow through. Told you. <laughs> That's a little bit different than what you expected, isn't it? <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> Tennis. Yeah, show. we're on TV here. I can wear my tennis shoes and I can wear my shorts and I can be comfy. But I look professional, don't I? <laughs> He's sorry, yeah, thank you. Okay. Funny, baby. You can laugh. Scott's on him. Yeah. But it's to make a point, okay? That professionalism goes farther than just initial appearance. Let's look at a couple of other things, all right, that could be guiding principles underneath that. <laughs> all students should be treated with respect. Think about that for a minute. Okay. And think about any number of businesses that you might go to. Think about if you walked into a mechanic shop to have your car repaired and the people uh, at that shop greeted you with a smile. You didn't have to just stand there in the waiting room for a long time and nobody even noticed you were there, you know? But you were greeted quickly and pleasantly. The surroundings were clean. There was a place for you to sit and wait. Um, it looked like maybe they were organized. Then if you looked at the facilities, you'd see, well, they were clean also. The technicians were clean. Uh, that the technicians weren't smoking in somebody's vehicle. Those of you that are non-smokers, how would you feel if some technician was working on the inside of your car, you know, and smoking in it, and when you get your car back, there's some ashes on the seat and maybe the carpet, and it smelled like cigarette smoke. Mm -hmm. You know, to some people, that's extremely offensive. Or the shop floor was kind of dirty, so there's a greasy footprint on your carpet. In there. Oh, see, it's real easy to see how your philosophy statement of a broad overall kind of statement that all professions could profit by increased professionalism. To me, that's part of professionalism, the appearance and keeping the place clean and that sort of thing, all right? And how you treat people with, with respect, it's just like you're treating your customer with respect when you keep their vehicle clean. I'm much more impressed if I go to a service facility and if they have to get inside the vehicle, they put a little cover on, or they put a little 
uh, paper mat down in the floor to be sure that your vehicle is kept clean. What I always used to do too when vehicles came in and I worked on them no matter what is we took five minutes and that's all it took was five minutes to take the vacuum cleaner over and do a quick vacuum on the floor and maybe uh, the seat and it didn't take much longer than that to just wipe it down to get or rinse the dust off so when that car was delivered the customer knew that they had been treated with respect. See, your students will feel the same thing, won't they? How, how do you treat someone with respect? Just think about that for a little bit because all we're really talking about right at this point is philosophy and principles, and we're going to, we're going to make application to actual practice in a little while. Another one. Oops. My finger stuttered. Professional dress should be required in school. Professional behavior and speech should be modeled by the instructor. These are principles that all point back to increasing professionalism in whatever trade that you're teaching, right? I'll give you another minute or two to kind of copy some of those down so you have a, <coughs> excuse me, have an idea of something here to, uh, to go by. principles you can also see that they apply to the instructor as well as the students. Students should be re treated with respect. If you were to extend that sentence on out it, it might read should be treated with respect by the instructor and by other students. Right? They should treat each other with respect. You should treat them with respect. They should treat you with respect as well. Professional dress. You know, that may be a pair of jeans and just a regular work shirt, okay? It could be coveralls and gloves. It could be any number of things. It could be a specific uniform, right? Okay, each trade area has dress that's appropriate for that trade. Uh, I taught at a school briefly that required instructors to wear a tie and we had uh, a shirt that was similar to the one I have on, same color and all that sort of thing, and it had our name across the top of the pocket and the school name on it and then we had just some dark slacks well that was nice in appearance but is a tie very practical in an automotive shop situation i don't think so all a tie is good for is to get in the way and certainly a tie that actually ties on can be extremely dangerous, right? Well, if you were to require a tie then, you need to kind of clips on. Well, I kind of balked at that because I thought they looked pretty dorky. Hey, I wear those. And it had to do then <laughs> with your professional image. The students see you with this dorky clip-on tie that doesn't stay clean. <laughs> 
just like your your shirt and your pants cannot stay clean in a paint shop in a body shop and pretty soon your professional image isn't too cool is it yeah so, the door so we had to rethink things a little bit professional behavior and speech should be modeled by the instructor uh, behavior has to do with dress as well as all sorts of other things. Sometimes we don't think of speech. Sometimes in order for the instructor to really get to know the student and be accepted as one of the guys, they think they have to tell stories and, and carry on with the students just like they were one of the boys. I think really there should be some professional separation between the instructor and the students. Okay, that can be reflected in the speech. And I think you really should set a higher standard for your students to approach. Um, again, I apologize to the guys that have had my VSO class. This is a repeat. But I always say that no one is going to be offended in your class or wherever by the dirty or off-color story that is not told. Okay, I think that's part of setting the higher standard, part of modeling uh, that standard. And all of you know that certain shops and certain trades in particular are prone to different kinds of uh, vulgarities, if you will, for lack of a better better word, okay? And sometimes they lapse into uh, really crude things. You know, some trades uh, that are mostly guys don't talk about women with, uh, with a whole lot of respect, okay? And if it doesn't really take a whole lot of thought for each one of you sitting there to come up with lots and lots and lots of examples from your trade area that address these particular issues. Okay? Why are we thinking about this? Because if the trade is going to improve, if you are training professionals, and if the image of vocational education and trades in particular are going to improve in the public's eye, what is going to have to happen? A higher standard of behavior and speech and appearance and safety and lots of these issues that we're talking about are going to have to be shown, aren't they? We're going to have to raise the standard. And that's what I'm talking about, and that's what your job is, okay? So you may not have thought when you signed on as a vocational teacher that you were going to have to be teaching uh, moral attitudes. You weren't going to have to be teaching you guys and students how to dress, how uh, to... Uh, maybe take care of their own personal hygiene. You would not have to address issues of sex and race bias, right? Off-color jokes and whatever in your classroom, rude t-shirts. Okay, I think everyone gets the idea of what I'm talking about, right? So, you see how an overall philosophy then translates into specific principles and how those specific principles guide your action in the classroom. Okay, I said that your public image is dependent on some things, right? And it should be obvious to the public what your philosophy is and the guiding principles that you operate under by what you do. Okay. There's some other issues.
issues that we, I want to look at for just a little bit that has to do with our image. First one that I think really comes to mind is the school building and facilities, right? First thing that the public sees is going to be the building. It's going to be the ground. It's going to be the it'll be the facilities that they can see as they drive by. Because not many of the public will actually come into the building or actually be a student or have occasion to come by your open house. They're not the parents of the students that come and visit the program or professionals that are on the advisory council that come by. The great majority of people in the community, the great majority of citizens, the only real impression are that they have of your school is of the building and facilities. What does that have to do with you? Well, you're part of that. It's how clean you keep them, how well maintained you keep them. That's part of what you do, right? Maybe more specifically, uh, the administration and the superintendent and the building and grounds people, the support staff, that sort of thing. The personnel is another thing. You are identified with that school. And wherever you go, whether you're at the grocery store or out at the lake at church, at a ball game, your actions and the way you're dressed and what you say directly reflect upon the public's image of that school. And it could be that how you deal with your neighbor or someone in the community uh, and, and what they think of you is going to translate to what they think of your school or what they think of your profession. How stereotypes get started and all sorts of things like that. Okay. Your public image is also dependent upon your students. How is your image dependent upon your students? Well, the students are going to see the facilities, they're going to see you, and they're going to take that home, aren't they? They're going to, they're going to take it back to their home high school, and they're going to talk about it. And their impressions, they're going to pass around. They're going to tell their parents, they're going to tell their friends. I really like tech. It's great. My teacher is great. You know, I'm learning a lot. Or they can say, this is the biggest waste of time. It's a joke. You know, other students pick on me and they make fun of me because I don't do too well or I'm a different color or, you know, whatever. You know, what kind of image do your students carry away? And what kind of uh, image do your students actually transmit to the rest of society, community? Then look at it from another point of view. The community looks at the students and looks at their behavior and says, hey, they go to Votech. They're really well behaved. Or they're really a bunch of scum. Right? So part of how you train your students are part of how your students behave when they're on a field trip or when they're wearing the jacket that is so neat that all the guys want that says Opry Tech, uh, auto mechanics on the back of it. You know, and then they're out in the public doing something that's not too professional. That doesn't really do well, does it? It doesn't say good things about your program. On the other hand, if they're wearing something like that, if maybe you're on a field trip to a certain industry or business or something, and your students are really well behaved, they ask 
intelligent questions, you know, that really says something good about the students and about your program and about you. It has to do with the image of vocational education, doesn't it? Another area that has to do with your students is how many of them actually go out and get jobs for what they've been trained. Okay? And if they did go get a job in that industry for which they've been trained, how well do they do? Are they successful? Are they really a cut above any other person that comes in to apply for that same kind of job? Is their VOTEC training really apparent? Does it really make a difference? Can the employer and the other employees look at that VOTEC graduate and say, hey, VOTEC really made a difference? So it all relates back to your philosophy and your guiding principles, doesn't it? Okay. It's a break time yet. The last thing on here is the value of learning. I just kind of alluded to that on that last statement about your students. It'll be apparent to the public by how your students behave and how well they do when those students graduate and they go out into the world of work. It'll be apparent to everyone. It'll be obvious to the student. It'll be obvious to the employer. It'll be obvious to the community just what value the learning was that that student got or did not get at Votech, right? How does that affect you? If you have a really good image, then what? The funding that your school operates under uh, is going to be much more secure, isn't it? We haven't talked about that yet, but we will briefly about how your school is funded and how your program is funded. But each area of vocational technical school is, is in an area in and of itself. It has its own board, and taxes are voted in that area to support that school. And so the community could say, no, they're not using our money wisely. We're not going to vote that in. And they could vote that millage down. And then the school have a really tough time making the budget. Or the community can see that the school really looks good, it's well maintained, and you know, it's one of those things that the community can be proud of. The students are really uh, being trained well and going out into, and getting jobs and doing well, becoming successful. So they say, yeah, it's valuable to our community and we're gonna vote that millage in. We're gonna vote our support. That's on a real basic level. Okay, I think right now uh, might be a good time for you to kind of think about those things for a little while, and we're going to uh, take a break. Uh, I've got about 20 after. Let's start collecting back here at about 8.30, okay? Take 10, no more than 15 minutes, okay? And we'll come back. <laughs> oh, Thank you. my goodness, you're welcome. Oh. The building begins on page 14, and uh, there's really a series of six articles, uh, about every two to three pages or so. The last one's on page 28. First article says it's about a survey. Uh, what do parents think about vocational education? The second one is coping with crisis. Third one is going to market, uh, marketing your school. Next one is working with the media and reputation management and stargazing. Okay. I'd like, um, I'd like for you to look at these 
these articles in uh, relation to what we've been talking about tonight as far as philosophy and principles. And I want you to take a few minutes right now and go through these articles, and you don't have to do all of them, but uh, I, th I think everyone should pick at least three, and, and guys, where there's um, two or three or four of you in a, or I guess two or three in a particular site, you can do a little more. Maybe one of you take uh, an article apiece or two, and try to do several of them. And look at them, number one, for what kind of a philosophical statement that you might come up with, that whoever wrote that article, uh, what they might think. And look at some principles. And most of the time in these articles, they're really good about saying, hey, if they don't specifically say this is a principle, they will say, here is something that you can do. And that translates real readily into a principle underneath that overall philosophy. And there are usually some examples given of how this really applies to their, their practice. And I want you to take a few minutes and go over these articles and see what we can come up with. All right. Um, I hope you wrote down some of those examples that I gave you. Let's, let's use that as a format. Make a philosophical statement and then a couple or three principles underneath that philosophical statement that might go with each one of these articles. And I'll give you about uh, 15 minutes to do that. We'll come back and try to share some of those with each other. Hmm. What do people think of you? Of us? Management crisis? Or coping with crisis? Or, oh, what do people think of us?
Okay. Yes. I chose the article Coping with Crisis. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me now? Oh. Okay. No. Philosophy, I believe, is professionalism, should be evident in a crisis situation. Principle. One of the principles would be the truth first, last, and always. Look professional would be another uh, principle. Would be look professional and act professional. This includes your dress. Keep your cool. You need to be rested. Be courteous. Speak clearly. Show concern. You should always have a crisis plan, implement that plan, and that should have already been practiced before the crisis actually occurs. Are you hearing me? <laughs> I can hear you, but not very well. I've really got to listen closely. That's pretty much uh, all I have. Okay. Um, did you find in that something useful? Well, yes, I did. Uh, because I guess at, at most every school, sooner or later, you're going to have a crisis. I know we had one last year. Nothing real, uh, not real severe, but, but bad enough. I think we handled it quite well, but we were actually not prepared beforehand. You know, we didn't have yes. a plan, and I, right. think, I think it's really important uh, that, that you do. Now we have a system. Uh, at that time, we didn't, and, and we handled it okay, but it could have been much worse. So, I don't know, that kind of caught my eye. It was interesting. Okay, very, very good. Thank you. Uh, all right, let's move to Tulsa. If we can, and Tulsa did pick a, another article, and uh, let's talk about what you came up with for uh, a philosophical statement. Now I can see Wade. Can you hear me? Okay. Talk, talk uh, kind of loud and clear, and I'm going to stay off the line because we're getting feedback from me. Okay, we couldn't hear Sandra, so we don't know what she did. Uh, I picked the article on page 24, News Not Old Gets Attention. And the philosophy was realistic expectations are the seeds of a fruitful relationship with the media. And they basically listed uh, the principles uh, in one article they call them Remember the Basics, they're on page 25. There's about 17 of them. And I won't read them all, but just call the reporter by name or return calls within 15 minutes when you can. And you can go down the list and look at those uh, that they gave right there. Okay. Did you, find, did you guys find something that was useful or practical? I think the news that uh, we give to the media needs to be uh, unique and not just uh, a tour of the ordinary. Okay. Does anyone, Does anyone else, else at your else side have something, something that they would like to add? Well, we all did a separate article. Do you want to get a different one? Okay, that's fine. Well, let's, let's move on to another one then. Uh, oh, Mogi. Oh, there you go, buddy. I you saw did. you guys kind of talking together and working together there. Uh, oh, boy. Let's go to Oak Mogi if we can. I'm all out And, uh, you want me to do this one? Can you hear me, Mr. Swigger? Yes, okay. Is that Carlos? Yes, sir. Okay. Which article did you guys choose? Well, we, we went over a few of them, but this uh, one we started with uh, was going to market, 
And I believe the philosophy there is if you're going to advertise your program, you must present a positive image. Okay. What kind of principles then did you identify? Okay, we identified, uh, first of all, you have to address specific uh, audiences. Um, let's see, supply relevant and useful information in the ads that's going to pertain to them. And uh, getting industry involved is also one of them. There's various uh, uh, guidelines supplied here. Uh, let's see what else. And quality of marketing obviously ought to be uh, good. Let's see. Uh, is there anything else, guys? Uh, probably keeping pace with the technology, keeping uh, pace with the workplace, keeping in contact with your communities. Uh, keeping your high schools and parents involved, trying to get them uh, involved in, in uh, your marketing, getting the advertisement. Okay. Very good. Anyone else uh, there have something that they would like to add at this point? <laughs> Pretty well covered for you guys. Okay. Um, let's go to uh, McAllister if we can and talk to Brent for a minute. Okay, Brent. Identify which article that you chose. Yeah, was off the I did a couple of them. The one <laughs> that I'll do is uh, the uh, image thing uh, and the philosophy that I had. Uh, okay, about. which which page was that? Excuse me. Okay, uh, let's see. That was page uh, fourteen. Okay, the first article then. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. Okay. The Botec image uh, problem is one of our biggest problems today. That was the uh, philosophy. The principles that I had is that there are many false stereotypes about uh, vocational education. Uh, uh, some of the people feel that vocational education is for low achievers, would be another one of the principles. And another one would be many people have not had contact with or first-hand knowledge of vocational education. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to share? Maybe comments on some of the earlier ones. The first two I did not hear the audio on, so no comment okay. on that. Uh, the marketing one is the other one that I did on mine, and I, I thought it was, they did a real good job on theirs. They covered All right. that, but I didn't. Thank you. So okay.
uh, keeping staff and students informed during the crisis. Uh, on the, I think I heard someone talk about the marketing a while ago. I heard Carlos was the only one I could hear. Probably of, of going uh, of that one, a principle that I would include it in there would be the uh, uh, that one that caught my idea was that marketing was an investment and not an expense uh, to try to offset that. I also did the first one as well, if you want me to comment on it. Sure, go ahead and take a couple of minutes if you'd like. Okay, I talked about that the, uh, you know, it showed the survey showed a mixed reviews of, of vocational education's image, uh, that uh, uh, philosophies that people who had direct uh, contact with the programs rated them higher than those who had no contact, that uh, vocational greatest strengths uh, is its impression of, its, of teaching job skills. Sur surveys show that students uh, serve all students and anybody would benefit from vocational education. Uh, surveys show that students do a very good job in explaining uh, our concepts. We that, that we don't, excuse me, that we don't do a very good job in explaining our concepts such as tech prep and school to work. That's just some things that I wrote down on those first three articles. Okay. Thank you. I I know some of you could hear some a little and some not at all, but uh, I hope maybe that uh, you got a little bit out of it. I'd like to take a few minutes and share some of my thoughts with you. Uh, with regard to these articles in particular and uh, what they represent uh, kind of in general, okay, about what we've been talking about. Uh, first of all, uh, the first article on page 14 that was a survey that Techniques uh, Magazine actually uh, did, not a not an extensive survey, not one that you can genera uh, generalize to the uh, public as a whole, but it does, like they said, it really gives uh, you an idea of maybe some of the, the ideas that are floating around, okay? One of the things that I noticed that they brought out in this is that we really do not do a good job as vocational education about letting people know what we do, okay? And uh, that really, uh, the students are probably the best source of information about what we really do. Uh, the second article, Coping with Crisis, I think that's a, a really large philosophical issue I would probably say the philosophical statement or the philosophical issue here that it's dealing with is that uh, crises do happen. And so for the school, it's how that crisis is handled that's really important to that school's reputation. And more than just the reputation of the school, it uh, is really important many times to the lives and safety and the education of the students, okay? Specifically, and I think they gave really uh, four good examples of some real life happenings that were crises. First of all, we all know that the reason uh, for safety programs in a school in the first place or in business or industry is to help avert a crisis right? But no matter how well you plan for safety and how well organized you are, some things happen that uh, cannot be controlled, right? Okay, let's, let's look at some examples. And I know Scott will be able to uh, identify uh, the one with the community college uh, in Colorado that the police academy students were cleaning a firearm and there was a live round. Okay, that addresses 
an issue of safety and organization in that classroom, doesn't it? That was an accident that probably could have been avoided altogether, right? So the issue here is how the school handles the crisis once it happens, right? The article goes on to say that uh, it's important that the school and everyone involved in the school show that they're really concerned about what happens and that they really uh, want to be sure that a proper investigation is conducted and that measures are put in place to see that something like this doesn't happen again, right? Those are principles that you can get from that overall uh, philosophy that, you know, we want to be prepared for crises. Crises are going to happen, but we're going to be prepared, okay? That's the philosophy. The principle would be, one, that you need to show proper concern, one, that you studied it well and that uh, organization is put in place so that things like that don't happen. Okay, then you can look at the example of Tulsa and see a crisis that didn't even have anything to do with that campus. It happened away from the campus. Uh, a construction uh, site, something was going on where a backhoe dug into a line and some gas was released. Well, with the prevailing wind, it was heading towards the campus. Okay? This was something outside the control. It didn't make any difference how well organized the campus was, how safety conscious they were in each of the programs. This is something that imposed itself on the school from the outside. But it was still a crisis, and the school still needed to have some sort of response in the works, right? Well, Tulsa did not at the time. It was kind of like Sandra shared uh, with us the very first that they had a crisis this last year that they were not prepared for. They hadn't planned for. There was no plan in existence for how to handle it. But yet they were able to handle it, and that was good. But had it maybe taken a little bit different turn, Maybe it would have been a really bad situation. So now they are uh, planning and have plans in the works to take care of some of these crises should they come along. So at this point, I want to ask you, uh, are you aware of any plans that your school has to deal with different kinds of crises? I'm sure most of you will say, oh, yeah, sure, we have a fire drill, and we have a, a plan in place on what to do if there's a tornado. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of that. public law. That's school law. It says those have to be in place. And within the first couple of weeks of school, you have to have your first fire drill, and you have to have them so many times thereafter, right? Everybody's familiar with that. Yeah. But how about some of these other things that are uh, mentioned in the article, okay? If your school does not have something in place, what does that say about the philosophical stance of the school? Maybe that's something that they do not value because they do not address it. That's one explanation, I guess, right? Or Maybe the school is just not well prepared because they haven't thought of it. That cr a crisis has not happened to cause them to deal with it, right? Okay, so you can look at different individuals, different programs, different schools and school systems, and you can find out something about their philosophy by how well they are prepared for different crises, right? Okay, think about these in di other different areas too. I'm talking about practical applications of your, your philosophy 
and the principles that guide your everyday uh, behavior. All right? Let's look at the next article. Uh, going, to, oops, going to market. Uh, the next one after that also makes them, oops, no, no, not that one, the last one. Number tw uh, page 26, reputation management. And it asks the question, who needs an image? And very first off, it, it uh, mentions that this person, Pat Jackson, who is a public relations consultant, says he doesn't want his clients to have an image. He is not an image, an image manager because an image, by the definition, really is kind of false. That's kind of like me a while ago with my tie and my nice shirt on. That's kind of an image, wasn't it? But <laughs> then you really thing. find out what the real person is like. He's got the shorts and tennis shoes on, okay? Is that healthy for a school? Is that healthy for your program? Is that healthy for your students? To project just an image or do you want to develop a solid reputation that is backed up by uh, action that your students and what they do how they perform a contest what kind of jobs they get and how successful they are at their jobs really builds a solid foundation for you and your program and your students and your school. Okay? See, this really gets to a, um, a very important, I think, philosophical statement. And the principles are going to be different. If you subscribe to the idea that, well, yeah, you really ought to have an image, and image is the thing, and let's look good, and I have been to schools I worked for a school that the image was paramount. And it was real obvious because the principles that they operated under were obvious of how they behaved, what was important to them, how they uh, treated their instructors and how they treated the students. See? They would show and say one thing but when it really came down to it, you know, and really benefiting the students, it wasn't there, okay? One school in particular that I'm talking about is no longer in business. And we say in public education, we're funded, okay? We don't have to worry about going out of business. But that's not necessarily so. Uh, I conducted a national survey uh, about uh, two years ago, fall of 95, with regard to uh, vocational programs nationwide. I found a couple of trends that were a little bit disturbing. One, that vocational programs are closing, or let me back up vocational teacher education programs in colleges and universities are diminishing. Some of them are closing. Some that had been listed in the directory, when I called, there was no longer a department. There was no longer anyone there. And I found out that this department that they listed only had one or two instructors, maybe anyway. So, Really, vocational education still does suffer from negative reputation and negative image. And I think uh, the first article that they talked about uh, the image from parents that had students in vocational education, I mean, even there were some myths and misunderstandings there. I think about the people that don't have contact with your program and don't have contact with your school and don't really know. All right? So what are you going to do about it? 
We talked about that earlier too. It's important that you show professionalism and you talk up your school and your program and your profession and your trade in positive terms and professional terms wherever you are. You know, outside of school as well as in school. It's important that your school facilities portray a really positive image, right? Okay. I hope maybe that looking at these um, was valuable for you, okay? For a couple of reasons, and, and here's really what I'm wanting you to get out of this, all right? Number one, and I think uh, your trade journals and magazines are an important source. They're an important source of information for you and for your students and for your profession. And your students, as well as you, should become familiar with what's going on in there. Uh, it's a good way to communicate what's going on in the rest of the world. Sometimes you become isolated in your own class. You're not out and about with other people. I mean, we have August conference and we have midwinter conference. And you have a chance maybe during uh, contest time in April or at districts or something to talk with other instructors. But most of the time, you're kind of isolated in your own program. Your students are kind of that way, too. Their eye on the world is what you give them. And so sometimes it's a really good idea to see what's going on elsewhere. Part of that professionalism that we need to build. Some of you reading these articles recognize schools. Tulsa Tech from, from Tulsa, that's Oklahoma. Uh, you all are familiar with that. Maybe not a school in Carrollton, Georgia, maybe not one in Colorado, but hey, there's Oklahoma in there. When you look at the contest that they had for, for media marketing, oh, this Tulsa Tech right there, okay, a national winner in the competition. Right there on page 22, you see what uh, went on at Tulsa Tech. All right? That's good, positive stuff that needs to be shared. Sometimes you can get really good ideas from other people. It's a way to share ideas. Okay? Those guys have a budget. <laughs> but when you're reading this stuff, just because it's printed and just because somebody says, hey, this is great, this is wonderful, don't swallow it. Okay? Don't take it as gospel just because it's printed. You need to look at identifying the philosophical position that this person that's writing this or this... Um, or you can even, after a while, begin to identify the philosophical position of the editors and the publication itself. And they will take a certain view. So most of what is presented in their publication is going to be from that philosophy, okay? From that position. So learn to identify that and say, oh, okay, I see where they're coming from. And you can adjust it, whether you agree with it or don't agree with it. You at least can look at it from a realistic perspective. Learn to identify the principles. And some of these that are well written, and I happen to think that Techniques is one of those publications that's pretty well written, are usually pretty straightforward. They will give their position right off. And then they will list, many times by bulleted lists, or by uh, bold headlines, they will list the principles that they're identifying, okay? So you really don't have to dig through and find them. They're not obscure, okay? So that's also good. 
Some of them that are not well written, you can identify them as not being well written, and maybe the information is not that good either if it's not all that well presented. Because you have to dig through it and you say, okay, what are they saying? What, is, what are the principles that they're trying to get across? What do they want us to do with it? Okay? And if you can't answer those questions, if they're not clear, if it doesn't answer something of, you can't tell what's valuable to them or what's truth to them, maybe there's not a whole lot of value in the article itself. Okay? This is something you should also think of if you are one that is writing an article. You're one that is trying to present something in your local newspaper. You're one who is trying to put together a brochure for your program. Think about it. Do you identify something readily that somebody can look at and say, oh, okay, I see the position they're taking. I see what is valuable to them. And then they can readily identify the principles that you're putting forth, okay? All right. I'd like to take another short break, and we'll come back and talk about, uh, and make this a short break, folks, <laughs> like five, okay? Five, no more than ten. And uh, we'll come back and we'll talk about the handbook and how what we've been talking about here relates to this assignment and uh, wind up tonight, okay? We'll even talk about the midterm for just a little bit, okay? Let's take five and be right back, okay? Damn, it's Christmas. It's time to go home and be reviewing anything, is he? That was listed in your syllabus. Oh, the handbook. First thing off, the handbook should have a title and table of contents. You make this any size you want to. I don't care. All right? But do not make it bulky like a three ring binder or something. Put it in a, uh, you can <laughs> staple them or put it in uh, a little soft back folder. Because you'll need to hand this in toward the end of the semester. Oh, sure. Right? I was going to say next week. Oh, my God. Either that or you need to make a copy of it so that you can keep. But uh, title page and table of contents. I Botech handbook. Whatever. Would <laughs> be <shit>. created. <laughs> but this is going to be as much for your use or more for your use than anyone else's. It should identify your workplace mission statement. What is a mission statement? It's kind of a statement of philosophy, isn't it? Yeah. Many mission statements go something, something like this. It is our mission to provide quality education for our students and for the workforce of tomorrow, or to prepare our students for success in the world of work. Or their mission, our mission is to provide uh, the best education that we can provide. Some kind of philosophical statement. All right? <coughs> it also should include the state and your personal philosophy here, or mission statement, if you will. If you remember last week, uh, Ivan presented to you, and in our book, you can go back and find uh, several statements of philosophy or of the mission. Some of them are also uh, prescribed by law, 
and you will read as you go through uh, some of the laws that are enacted, you will see where they prescribe certain things, all right? So you should have in mind what your goal, what your philosophy, what your mission uh, is in your program, all right? The next thing, along with your philosophy, you should identify principles that guide your practice. And that simply said is a visual image of your classroom and your teaching. A visual image. Okay? I'll give you a couple of examples here as, as we go through this. Remember earlier on I talked about the elementary classroom uh, a couple of weeks ago about the elementary classroom uh, where you might go and this is a reading class and the teacher is sitting on a comfortable carpet on the floor and the students are all gathered around and the book has large illustrations and the students are all looking at the book as the teacher reads and they're discussing what's going on with the story as opposed to the classroom that all the chairs are in a row and the students are sitting in the chairs and they go down through and each student reads a sentence or reads a paragraph or something and the teacher is standing up front and just looking at them. It should be obvious that there are two different philosophical perspectives here going on, right? There are different sets of principles that are being applied to the teaching practice in those two classrooms. But my description gives you a visual image of those classrooms. So, in my personal classroom, as an auto body instructor, my philosophy was that everyone should have an equal opportunity to learn and another philosophy philosophy would be that uh, that each student should have uh, an exposure to the entire trade before they pick particular parts of it that they really want to specialize in okay so how would that apply as far as principles on how, how would my classroom look, okay? What would be a visual image of how I would conduct my classroom in accordance with that philosophy and those principles, okay? One would be that I organize my class in such a way that the beginning students start out learning all of the basic things right? And that as they progress through the class and through the program, that they learn successfully, uh, as they learn things successfully, then they move on to things that are more complex. And after they once go through all the different things, the, the metal work, the tools, the welding, the, the body work, the bondo, the primer, the sanding and the masking, all those sorts of skills, after they once have gone through all of those, then they can, in their last quarter of their senior year, or actually, excuse me, the last quarter of their experience, which would be uh, basically the last semester, they can start specializing. So that I have built into my organization and my management in the classroom <coughs> those kinds of things. Then the last nine weeks, the seniors are able to bring in their own projects and work on their own projects. If they want to paint their own car or something like that, they can do that as long as that project is approved by me first and it is really something that is worthwhile and is using the skills that they learned there. Okay, so it, it gives them, uh, my actions then, let me put it that way, my actions then are consistent with my philosophy. 
philosophy and my principles. All right. Let's take that one step farther. If you as an instructor uh, are thinking about something new to do in your program, or the school says, hey, let's do something different, let's add this to our curriculum, you're going to have to look at that particular thing that you're thinking about doing and say, well, does that really fit in? Okay? How does that fit with the philosophy? How does that fit with my mission? Is that consistent with the principles that guide my practice? If it is, okay, it'll probably work fairly well. If it's not consistent, it's probably not going to work very well. Okay? And so you see a lot of projects and a lot of things that, uh, new programs that are instituted or something that don't do well. Why? Because they're inconsistent with the philosophy and they're inconsistent with the principles that guide practice. Okay? So this is a chance for you then to take uh, a step in your own um, professionalism, a step in your own education, a step, step in your own growth, and be proactive. Which simply means it's a chance for you to take this notion of philosophy and principle and, and look at what you do and see that it fits an organized pattern, okay? So that you are guided in what you do, so that your goals that you set, both short-term and long-term, are guided and are just not done haphazard. Okay, let's go on and see how this fits in with your handbook. Okay. Um, you should also provide in this handbook an organizational chart, one for your school, one for the state, and one for OSU. How do you fit in to this organization? We've talked about this before, okay? Along with that, you should have the addresses, fiscal address, email, phone numbers of those people and those places that are important to you and your program, all right? You know that you have a site director or a school principal that you can go to directly. You also know that there's the school board and the superintendent. There's also a district supervisor at the State Department. There's also a su uh, supervisor there that is trade specific for you. Who is that? What is his number? What is his email address? Uh, do you know that? Do you know what services are provided? See, this needs to be in your handbook so that you'll have a ready resource that you can go to and use that resource. It's also a good idea to know where your funding comes from, and we're going to talk about this later, okay? But this is going to be part of your, your handbook. Who funds your program and your school? What kind of funding is it? Is it federal? Uh, where does it come from? What kind, is it tax money? What is it? Where does it come from? How much is it? You should know. Okay? And you may be called upon from time to time to become involved in the funding of your program. Sometimes through your Sometimes through your committee, your advisory committee, uh, donations can be given to your, your program or your school. Who knows? All right? But you should have something kind of organized. Oops. Sorry. In your handbook should also be emergency plans. Now, your school probably already has some things in, in, in place. Like I talked about before, there's fire drills and that sort of thing. Well, that's a good place to put those kinds of things. 
in this handbook. You may need to also uh, develop within your particular program ways of dealing with emergencies. And there's different kinds of emergencies for different kinds of programs. All right, they may be health related issues, and maybe have to do with chemicals or equipment, whatever, okay? Your advisory committee should be listed in your handbook. Each one of these people, their name, their, their number, um, that sort of thing, they're a good resource as well as they're mandated by law for you to have. If you don't have them in place and functioning well, that's something that you're going to have to do. Then you should set some program goals, both short and long range. And there again, these goals need to be guided by your principles and your philosophy and the mission statement. Okay? They need to be consistent with what you're doing. If it does not fit in with your mission, then maybe you shouldn't be doing it. And maybe it's going to be really difficult to do, and maybe it's going to be a waste of time, and it's not going to be productive. Okay? You need to have some personal goals outlined. Short-term, long-term, professional, educational. That's a really good place to say, okay, like most of you now are working on some educational goals. Who are your resources? What are your resources? What are you going to do this year? What are you going to do next year? Where do you want to be in five years? Make a plan. And if your goal is to be uh, graduated in five years and to have your bachelor's degree, what's it going to take to do that? You're going to have to have a plan of study. You're going to have to figure out what classes it's going to take. Can you take them long distance like you are now? Pretty convenient. Or are you going to have to travel? You know, what kind of resources is it going to take? You need to start planning these things. This is a good place to put some of that. Okay? And to review periodically. And to also talk about other teachers, or talk with other teachers, and talk with uh, your, your teachers, uh, in, in university to get an idea of how you can go about that, okay? These are the kinds of things I want you to have in your handbook. So it's really kind of a portfolio assignment. It's going to be some things that you should be developing already as we've been talking about them. It's some things that we're going to talk about in class and that you'll develop and put in this handbook as we go through the rest of the semester. Okay? Think about these things. Get started with it. And uh, I'll answer questions as they come up along the semester. And I hope I'll, I'll be well organized enough that it's going to really tell you what you need to know beforehand. Okay. Now then, let's look at the midterm. Everybody be concerned with that since it happens to be next week. Wonderful. Here are the things that I'm going to be looking at. Basically, it's what we've covered so far. But here are the things that I think are basically important. You ought to have some working definitions of vocational and trade and industrial education. You should be familiar with some early history and social inventions that lead directly to T&I Ed, where we are now in vocational education. You should have a pretty good idea of what philosophy is and what it does, okay? It is a framework for identifying truth 
and reality and value. Okay? And what does it do? It gives you a framework for making decisions. Alright? That kind of thing. Also, some major legislative acts. And that, that really takes the form of what we've talked about before, basically the Smith-Hughes Act, but pages 106 through 136, I think. Yes, 136. Uh, really cover those. And I'll give you uh, a quick rundown of the ones that I'm really interested in, if you can write them down. Page 106 would be Section 1, Land Grant Colleges. If you just put Roman numeral 1, page 106, that'll pretty well cover it. Page 107 would be Section A under Roman numeral 4. and Section B on page 108. And for the most part, it's the general provisions that I'm interested in. Section C on page 109. Then on page 111 starts the Vocational Education Acts of 1963. Some general familiarity here. And there is a bunch of them, okay? There's a bunch of them. Basically, all I'm looking for <coughs> is how it impacts trade and industrial education. There are some amendments, such as the Vocational Education Amendments of 1976 on page 118. Page 118. You just need to know kind of what they are. And if you go back then to page 137, to the brown sheets, the assignment sheets that are in the back part of that section, there are some of those that will draw from the green sheet, the information sheet, and uh, that would be question number one, question number four, question number six, 7A, 7A, question 11, and question 12. So those questions in those brown sheets should correlate with kind of what I outlined as um, you needing to look at in the green sheets. Okay? That will cover the major legislative acts. And I'm not much into discussing them at length. You can read them. That's, I think that's probably good enough at this point. Then last week, you should have gotten a good idea of uh, Oklahoma's organization. There'll be some few questions from that uh, directly related to what's going to go into your handbook. Like... Who is your district supervisor? Who is your trade supervisor? Questions like that. Then on page 86, we've kind of been over this before too. There are some duties of the vocational and technical education teacher and uh, what VSOs go with what programs on page 86. There'll be a little information, a couple of questions 
from that. And that's basically it. That Do I need to leave that up there some more? I'll put that back up. copy that some more. I'll leave that up for just a little bit. If you have a question, um, we'll try to work the audio. Now go ahead and ask. Uh, if there's something that I'm you feel you strongly about, you want to call me at home ask if we need sometime to during the week, that's fine too. These, these numbers that you just mentioned, these pages. Oh no, that's to study for the test. Okay. If not, and uh, that's all I have for tonight. Dr. Swiger. All this information. You guys hanging in there. All this information that you give us, is this for the study for the midterm test, right? Try again, Willie. I, I couldn't understand you very well. All this information that you're giving us to study, is this for the midterm for next week, right? This is not the. Yeah. Okay. Do we need to turn in the? Yeah, do we need for to turn the, for the midterm exam next week? Right. So we don't need to work it out and send you nothing, mail it in to you or nothing. We just need to study it. Oh, are those assignment sheets? No, you do not need to turn them in to me. Okay. That's kind of study questions, basically. Okay. Are questions that you might see on the midterm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, generally speaking, the the assignment, the brown assignment sheet. Um, that relate to what we talked about is is really uh, what I'm going to be looking at, and what I spent time on in class is really what I'm going to spend time on in the midterm. There's a lot of reading in here, stuff that you really should know probably, but uh, you're not going to be tested on all of it. Okay, a lot of it to me, the information comes in the category of, gee, that's nice to know, but I'm not really going to do anything with it, particularly. It's the stuff that I think um, really makes a difference on how you teach and what you teach and how effective you are as a teacher and how easy uh, your life as a teacher can be. <laughs> it's, your, it's your practice that I'm looking at. Okay, and so those things that apply directly to your teaching in the classroom, uh, that's the main thing, the things that affect you, that's what I'm really going to focus on this semester. Okay. okay, could you tell me kind of the flow matter of the test, is we going to be a lot of definitions or multiple choice or what? Uh, not a lot. And they, they it's not going to be just regurgitation stuff. It's stuff that you can, that you you should use. Okay. Okay. That you would need. I'm just not going to give you a list of stuff to match up or whatever. Okay. Uh, we will have the midterm next week, and it'll take probably about an hour. Or we'll reserve an hour for it. Um, we'll do that the very first of class, and then we'll go on and do something else, okay? Try to make some productive use of our time and move on, okay? If there are no other questions, that's all I have for tonight. Mr. Um, Sweeter? Yes. Will we, will we mail the midterm in to you after we take it? How will we? How will yeah. We Maybe, maybe I should make a comment about, about that. Uh, yes, you will mail it in to me, just like you mailed your uh, other assignments. But I would suggest that you take uh, an address stamped envelope with you to class, and especially those of you uh, where there's two or three of you there. And just put both.
both of them in the envelope and send it off. Put it in the mail the very next day. And uh, I never intended for you guys to spend a lot of money or this to be a really big deal. But some of you send stuff like Federal Express and, you know, uh, Express Mail and it costs five or six or seven bucks or something like that. You know, I had no intention of that happening. I just thought, you know, you put it in a regular envelope, maybe cost you a little bit of overpostage, 50 cents or something, and send it first class mail. Okay? Uh, unless, of course, you procrastinated and you only had a couple of days to get it in. <laughs> That's a little different. Then you deserve to spend the extra bucks, okay? But, no, uh, this particular um, test, we just slip in an envelope, put it in the mail the next day, and I'll be waiting on it, okay? And I ought to have it from anywhere in the state. I ought to have it in two or three days or so. Sometimes something will happen, but, you know, this is not a real big deal, okay? Those of you that had my classes before, you know, it's, my tests are not the bulk and the be-all of the class, okay? That's just something we have to do. So that's kind of where I'm at, right? Any other questions? Bill? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Brent? The uh, presentation that Ivan gave last week, um, yes. I wanted a copy of that. Are those going to be sent out? I tried making some copies, but uh, his diskette would not talk to my computer. So I'm working on it, but yeah, we'll, we'll get some of that out. Okay, well, our time's up. They're going to be cutting us off here. So thank you, everybody, and I'll see you next week. All right. If y'all want to give them a test to me next week, I can I mail them out to my school. Because I feel